16. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Now, what's Acts 13? This is an Antioch church. Acts 13. The Antioch church is the greatest example of a functioning New Testament church. In Acts 13, greater than the church at Jerusalem. Had great impact with the nations. They sent the gospel around the world. That, that's the kind of church this is. This is what we're moving. We're, we really have been this, but now God is like activating us right now. He's activating us at a new dimension. You better get ready. Some of you will go to the nations with us, with apostolic teams that we'll take to the nations. Some of you, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a team effort, church, but get ready. Our season is upon us right now. Right now. You better be ready. Praise God. But see, you have, you have presbyteries and you have... You had prophets and teachers. And as Acts 13.1 talks about, and the church at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. List them. Paul and Barnabas are listed there. Okay? As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Wait a minute. There are already prophets and teachers. What do you mean? What, what have they been doing? Spinning their wheels? Brother Hagin pastored like 14 years and Jesus appeared to him and said, now you're going to begin your first stage of your ministry. He's like, I've been in ministry 14 years. What are you talking about, Jesus? Amen. He said, many, many ministers live and die and never enter the first phase of their ministry. Never enter the first phase of their ministry. Did you know that? Many do, unfortunately. But no, if we're faithful and really follow the plan of God, we can move in the different... And he, he went into four different phases of his ministry while he was on planet Earth before he left over, over 60 years of ministry. And obviously had tremendous impact on the world. How many of you were impacted by Brother Hagin's ministry somewhere or another? The rest of you didn't raise your hand. You are, you just don't know it. You heard somebody else teaching that was impacted by him. You heard somebody else preach something, they, they listened to his tape. And they regurgitated it. He's had such a massive impact on planet Earth. It's, it's, it's amazing, amen? But it wasn't him. It was God's plan that he walked out. Now, see, I believe that for every believer, whatever you're called, whatever venue you're called in, you will have a massive impact on planet Earth, amen? It doesn't matter if you're called to a five-fold office. Whatever you're called to, you will have massive re results and impact as you walk out the plan and the purpose of God for your life, Amen. So you had a strong presbytery, prophets and teachers in the church at Antioch. But then the Holy Ghost says, hey, this one's called to the apostolic ministry. This one's called to the apostolic ministry. They're called to be a team and they're called to go out. And they laid their hands on Paul and Barnabas and they send them out. And now you have all these churches that get birthed by the apostles traveling ministry, right? Pioneering ministry. of So... How does this process of reproduction in the church work? Prayer and fasting and ministering to the Lord, prophecy with word of knowledge or word of wisdom about different offices and, and callings, prophetic activation of the ministry offices, and apostolic impartation of grace for the call. Can we go to the next slide? Praise the Lord. Aren't they doing a great job on the slides? Yes. So the two legs, look, two legs. We have two legs of the church to... Form the reproductive cycle. You have presbyteries and you have apostolic teams. If one leg is shorter than the other, your back gets jacked up. <laughs> Putting it in natural terms, right? In other words, a church in its maturity, as it reaches maturity, will have a strong local presbytery and strong apostolic teams to go to the nations. And then this forms the reproductive cycle of how apostolic churches impact the world and the nations. Here they are. Number one, the gospel is preached. Amen. Number two, people accept Christ. Number three, apostles set up the order of elders or a presbytery in a local church that's formed. Okay? That's, that's a spirit function that happens. It isn't a, well, I think you'd be pretty good at this. It's got to be done by the, the whole thing has to be done by the Holy Ghost. Number four, prophetic instructions are received from the presbytery, okay, this person is called in this church to be raised up as an apostolic team. That person's an apostle. That person's called to be a prophet. Let, let's get them matured, equipped, imparted. Okay, send them out. And then they go out. They're formed and sent out, anointed by the Spirit, called by the Spirit. And what do they do? The Gospels preach. This is the reproductive cycle of the New Covenant Church. And understanding it will allow us to reach the nations. Amen. So... What, what is God doing? 
Well, let's, let's rewind a little bit because I have to lay the groundwork and the context of where we came from, where we're at, and then we're going to talk about where we're going. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm so excited. I, I could preach all day. I'm telling you. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, the, the, church, the, the church as we know it was really started, the modern day church, in the, in the Protestant Reformation. Amen. Around the 1500s, um, Martin Luther nailed his thesis on a church door in Wittenberg, Germany, I believe it was. He had like 88 things that he saw the Catholic Church was violating the New Testament on. And he's like, here's 88 things that you guys are blatantly violating the scripture. One was they were selling indulgences to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, which is beautiful. It was a money issue. Right? They got off on a money issue and changed the word of God to, to meet a need because they probably weren't preaching prosperity like, like preached around here. People, they were probably preaching that God wants you to be broke, busted, and disgusted. But here, we'll, it, we'll, we'll sell stuff to try and meet the needs of the ministry. No, they were off. Amen? So what happened was, what was an indulgence? An indulgence would be given to you by a, uh, the Pope or, or someone in, with papal authority who could say, when you die, you get to bypass purgatory and go straight to heaven. Well, purgatory doesn't exist. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, and there is nothing in between. <laughs> to, be at, to, be, to, to be gone, to die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord or within the other place, the lake of fire. And our, our job is to keep people out of that place and populate heaven. Amen. That's our job. Amen. Praise God. So they were lying. And so Martin Luther says, wait a minute. We got it. I see that the Bible teaches justification by faith. And that was the pivotal revelation that started the New Testament church. And you can see it in Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. Isn't that awesome? That we are made at peace with our God by faith. That he loves and accepts us by faith. And the word justification means just as if you never sin. So God used, used Martin Luther in an awesome way to start a whole new reformation. We weren't there for it, but we benefited from it. Amen. Amen. And then after that, you had a ho holiness movement with the quake, or I'm sorry, before that, the, the Martin Luther's movement became, or became the evangelical movement. That started, you hear about, uh, evangelical churches. Evangelical churches are churches that believe in evangelism because you need to be born again. And he, that was his message. Justifications by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. And we've got to understand that. The grace of God is the message he got a hold of. And that started the evangelical movement, which was the first restorational movement of the church that God strategically released. Now, about 100 to 150 years later, there was a holiness movement with Quakers and others who emphasized living holy lives, living separa separated, set-apart lives. Now, we live in the world, but we're not of the world. Right. Amen. Amen. We live in the world, but we're not to be of the world. So, praise God. <laughs> I don't have time to preach about all that, but you understand what the Bible teaches. It teaches a life of holiness. It teaches that we should, that we should live like Jesus, doesn't it? And it teaches us if we love him, that will be a natural thing that happens. It's about love. It's not about works. Amen? Now, then God starts accelerating these movements. They were happening like every 200 years, every 150 years. The next movement is Azusa Street. Actually, 1901 in Topeka, Kansas, some of the first people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes. That went to Houston, Texas uh, with William Seymour, I believe it was, or Charles Parham. I'll need to look it back up. But anyway, then it ended up going to Azusa Street in Los Angeles at the Azusa Street Mission, and that's history, 1906 to 1910. There was a huge Pentecostal outpouring Thousands, tens of thousands of people, who knows how many, got filled with the Holy Ghost. The Assemblies of God denomination, many Church of God denomination, many of the Spirit-filled denominations came out of that outpouring that happened in Azusa Street. And it's estimated that 500 million people were affected by it worldwide. 
through people who came to it, got touched, and went out to different nations. Huge impact. That was the latter reign movement. Okay, the former reign is the book of Acts. That was the first powerful move of the Holy Ghost. Now you have the latter reign movement, which is Azusa Street. Okay? Then after that, the, the, the restorational movements of God start happening faster and faster and faster. You have the healing move from in the 1940s, about 1948 to 1958 approximately. And in that movement, you have people moving and signs, wonders, and miracles and healings happening. And you have the voice of healing and Oral Roberts and Kenneth Hagin and Prophet William Brannan and uh, uh, Jack Coe and all kinds of others are preaching in tent revivals around the nation and, and, and public evangelism. The first time you had miracles on TV, Oral Roberts had a TV broadcast where he would broadcast people getting healed live on TV. Is that cool or what? I love it. Praise God. I mean, people walk up jacked up, crippled, whatever it was, get healed on the spot. The big goiter goes down on the spot. I mean, it's just awesome. Amen. God's cool. So you have technology and the move of God starting to be leveraged together, which is really awesome. Then you have, after the healing revival of the 50s, you have the charismatic renewal of the 60s, where God is now pouring His Holy Spirit on all kinds of denominational churches that were previous, previously cessationists. They were saying the Holy Spirit and His move was for the book of Acts, but now that we've got Scripture, same lie. See, the devil's not too creative. He, I can't think of another lie. Let me see if they'll swallow this one. Uh, just because the apostles and prophets passed away, so also the Holy Spirit has passed away. Oh, my gosh. I mean, that's kind of how dumb can you get and still breathe territory if you ask me, but that's, that's just my opinion. It's really deception. See, the devil's very slick. He's good at deceiving people. Amen? The charismatic renewal of the 60s, then the Jesus movement of the late 60s and early 70s. Then we moved into a teaching movement in the 80s. Okay, in the 80s, there was a teaching movement. Um, then in the 90s, there was a decade of harvest. Something, let me back up. Something else happened in the 80s that was very significant. God restored the office of the prophet. Now, there were some prophets before that, but not in mass like God wanted. There was a few prophets and many people that were called prophets, they called them pastors, they called them teachers, evangelists. They couldn't quite figure them out what... He, I guess you're an evangelist. You can't be a prophet even though you're spirit of seeing and knowing and words of knowledge and wisdom and gifts of... Anyway, all this stuff that goes with the prophet's ministry and yet they, they wouldn't accept what they were but they had the function. But in the 80s, God really started raising up uh, prophets <clears throat> in the body of Christ to understand that we need that ministry gift for today, okay? In the 90s, we, it was a decade of harvest. The first altar call was given before the close of that decade that saw a million people come to Jesus in one altar call. So there was great harvest that started happening in the world in the 90s. There was tremendous harvest in, the, in that decade. And God began restoring the office of the apostle in the, in the 90s. Okay, Now it's been a slow restorational process that's happened little by little. And that's one of the reasons the Lord is helping me teach on this, having me teach on this, so we understand where we're at and where we're going. Um, the 2000s, now in, in the year 2000s, there was a seven-year spiritual drought. Let me tell you about this briefly. From September 19th, 2003 to September 19th, 2010, two very notable prophets prophesied about this. Um, separately. Brother Hagin died September 19th, 2003. And because many in, in the Word of Faith camp, they would teach and preach the Word of Faith, but they would not move in the Holy Ghost. They became stale. And they were staying in the 80s move of God rather than going on. Because see, this move of God that we're in now is Word and Spirit, not just Word. It's Word and Spirit. And so for seven years, there was a drought in the church. There was little revival overall, little move of God. But praise God, that drought is over. Amen. That drought, drought is over. Now, <laughs> praise God, hallelujah, forevermore. I can't tell you how supernatural God has been guiding what I've been receiving this week. It's been so providential and so powerful. 
Now God is restoring the apostolic gift in the church with the following principle. It's Mark 10, 31. Many that are first shall be last and the last first. Do you understand that the apostle was the first ministry gift for eight years in the church, but the apostle was lost. Now the apostle is the last gift that God is restoring to the church. And now we will have a church that looks like and functions like the book of Acts, only greater, only greater. It's going to be greater. Why? Because the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the glory of the former house. The former was the book of Acts. Church, the book of Acts, we, we, I know it only records the 28th chapter. I don't know if we're like on chapter 56 or what chapter 5,000, but we are writing the book of Acts today. The book of Acts was the Acts. The book of Acts was called the Acts of the Apostles. But it's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles and early church. Amen? Amen. Now the book of Acts is going to be the, the Acts of the Apostles and the believers and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers. Amen. The Acts of the Holy Spirit through all of us. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and uh, praise God, I'll tell you what, when we get to heaven, we're going to have some stories. I mean, we've already got stories, and I know you've got stories, but I'm telling you, when we get to heaven, I, I said this before, I was talking to a prophet friend of mine, I said, he said this, and I loved it, I just love getting around him sometimes, I love the way prophets think, he said, man, I don't want to get up there and be sitting down and talking to Peter, James, or John, and they're like, yeah, Peter's like, yeah, I was walking through the street. In Jerusalem, and they started lining the people up because when I'd walk by and my very shadow would go by, they'd get healed. Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. He said, I don't want to go up there and go, I was a closet Christian that lived halfway committed and half. And... <laughs> no, 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 no. No, we want to have some fun war stories about us trampling the devil when we get to heaven. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. So that which God released first in the church age was lost through the strategic attack of a religious spirit that removed apostles and prophets from the church. Now at the very end of the church age, the same office, mantle, mindset of the early church is being restored and the apostolic church is rising again and we'll see the same kind of power and glory and even greater that the early church saw and we are one of those churches Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Apostolic and prophetic revelation and impartation is now being released into the church for total transformation. Soon the church will not look anything like it looked in the past 50 years. You know, people are going to go, this is so different. This, and it's so better. Why didn't we do this all along? Hallelujah. And listen, let me tell you the difference. Between, and I'm not preaching on the apostolic church today. I was going to try and preach on the characteristics of apostles, but I haven't been able to get there. But here's the thing. The apostolic church, here's the difference. If you have an owner that owns a professional sporting franchise, okay, their goal is money and revenue, fame and notoriety for their team. That's the owner mentality. And that's the let's build my kingdom mentality, which is not the apostolic mentality. The apostolic mentality of the church is let me activate every single person in the fullness of their grace and power and anointing and to get right where they go in the body so every joint supplies and the sum of the parts is a million times more pow powerful than brother doodad and great and wonderful and this and that person the other. We've had, we've had in the church, uh, we've had, you know, the five-fold ministry has been so exalted, amen, and it's not that it's bad to honor because the Bible says those offices are worthy of double honor. And the other ditch is getting rid of all honor and being, being a seeker-sensitive church that, that doesn't have any reverence or honor, and that destroys the move of God, okay? I'm just telling you. So we're not a church like that. But the other thing is, is people, believers, not getting activated in what God's called them to do. And then when that happens, those joints aren't supplying because they haven't been activated. An apostolic church will activate every anointing and every believer, put them in the place in the body. And the whole body, instead of functioning on 50% or 70%, is now focusing on f functioning on 100% of all of its systems, all of its power, everything working 100% and it produces a mighty move of God that will transform the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
Hallelujah. I don't have time to start talking about the apostles. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you about what the Lord did for me yesterday. Thanks. The Holy Spirit has been so strategic in my study time. And I know he always is, but this was just so supernatural. He took me to a series of videos on YouTube by a, a great apostle in our nation. His name is Dutch Sheets. He is a great apostle. Uh, now, I, I'm not trying to exalt a man, but he, he, if you were to put him in biblical times of a prophet, he would be like an Isaiah. He has tremendous authority and rank in the spirit realm. Wonderful man of God. Love him. Love his ministry. His book on intercessory prayer, if you haven't read it, it is the prayer manual. If you only had one, it's, full, it's power packed. And some of the things God's used him for, but he's a, he's a humble man. He's not like, look, you know, he's a humble man, but he is a powerful apostle of God. In 2010, and I'll do my best with this, because this is all going to have to just help me, Holy Spirit. What I was watching yesterday, um, he was in a city in Kansas. And I think this city, he was doing a meeting, and it was called Grain City, Grain City, Kansas. He said a podunk, little tiny town that he was in. And this is in late 2010, like November 2010, after this spiritual drought had ended. So this is real important for where we're at today and what God's doing. He's in this city, and he stops by the only gas station in the town, which is the gas station, the country store, and the whole kit and caboodle like you have in some small towns. It's like one intersection, one gas station, and you get your food there and everything because that's all they got. Right. And, it was, and I need to go back and listen to it, but either him or a little girl that was traveling with him on his ministry team went in, and there were two old guys sitting there talking. And they're, they're, they're sitting in and they're talking, and I believe it, the little girl heard, heard him say this. The little girl hears him say, the angels are on the move. The angels are on the move. And she comes back out to Dutch and is like, there's these two crazy old guys. I don't know what they're talking about. They're saying the angels are on the move. Well, you know, Hebrews 13 says, yes. be careful to entertain strangers yes. because some of us is unbeknownstly entertain angels unaware. And angels can take on human form where you don't know they're angels. And when you get to heaven, the Lord will play back some of that. You'll see, you thought that was a nice person. That one was an angel. And this one, that was, anyway, that's another story altogether. The angels are on the move. So Dutch goes in and he pretends to be looking for some food or something. And he's listening. And one of the guys pipes up and he says, and John Wimber has come to cut the grass. What does that mean? It means something very specific. John Wimber was the founder of the Vineyard Church. He's not on earth anymore. So he's not going to come and cut your grass tomorrow. This is prophetically speaking. You've got to understand prophetic language. Prophetic language. So he says, John Wimber is coming to cut the grass. What does that mean? John Wimber was, founded the Vineyard Church, and the thing he was known for, above all else, was power evangelism. Signs, wonders, and miracles that would occur in his ministry. And because of those signs, wonders, and miracles, amen, great masses of people would be affected with the gospel. So effectively, the Holy Spirit said, signs, the angels are on the move, and signs, wonders, and miracles are coming to cut the grass. What is the cut the grass? Cut the grass, what is it? That's the harvest. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. What's he talking about? He's talking about the harvest of souls. It's an apostolic strategy being released into the church. What is the strategy? Signs, wonders, and miracles are being released now, now, amen, into the church, hallelujah, into the church, and they are going to come and cut the grass and reap the harvest. The Lord spoke to Dutch Sheets and he said, the third great awakening is starting. And he went back to uh, this grain. And it, the reason the Lord took him to Grain City, Kansas, is the name grain. The name, grain. Grain meaning the wheat, the harvest, right? He said, signs, wonders, and miracles are coming to cut the grass. Hallelujah. So we're living in that day. And um, then the Lord took him to Acts chapter 3. As he was meditating on this, the Lord took him to Acts chapter 3. And there was the lame guy at the gate beautiful. Do you remember that? Yes. 
Now, Jesus has ascended. They've preached the gospel, and the Holy Spirit has fallen. Okay? And 3,000 people are received into the church. So Pentecost will produce 3,000. And Pentecost is great. But we're not in just Pentecost anymore. That's been established. What God is doing now, you see, in the Greek language, the gate beautiful, that word beautiful really isn't, it's not that it's transferred or translated wrong, but that gate beautiful is where we get the word hour. It's a time word. It means when everything happens in perfect timing, it's a beautiful thing. Now, let me, let me explain the miracle. You've got a guy who was lame from his mother's womb above 40 years old, deformed, jacked up, crippled legs, lying at the gate beautiful. Jesus himself had to walk by him at least 20 or 30 times, had to. He was there. He'd been there. That, that was his life. Not only that, the whole nation knew who, who he was. You see, five times, four times a year, depending on how the participation, people would come from the whole nation of Israel and make a pilgrimage during the different feasts to Jerusalem. All of them walked by this guy. All of them walked past him. There he was. Most of them, a lot of them probably threw him a buck or two, right? Helped him out a little bit. But they all knew about him. Everybody walked by him, may, may pretend to not look at him or something. Amen? But he was there. He, this, they knew who this guy was. And why did Jesus not heal him while he was on planet Earth? Because something beautiful was going to happen in the perfect timing. Thank you for joining us today for Times of Refreshing with Pastor James Fortune. We believe that this ministry will help you to rise up and walk in the authority and power available to every believer through the finished work of Christ. We would like to invite you and your family to Oasis Church. Oasis Church is located at this intersection of 2nd Street and Santa Fe Avenue in Edmond, Oklahoma. Oasis Church is a place where the freedom of the Holy Spirit and His gifts, exuberant worship, and powerful preaching and teaching of the Word of God flow freely. We have exciting ministries for your children from birth to 18 years old as well. If you would like to help support this ministry and send it to others who need the Word of God, you can send your offering to Oasis Church, 322 South Santa Fe Avenue, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73003. All gifts are tax deductible, and we believe that you will get a multiplied return on your gift both now and in the eternal kingdom of God.